How y'all doing, New York City? Yeah? Man, come on. I know y'all awake. I said, how y'all doing, New York City? Okay. Okay. If y'all don't know me, my name is Adrian Purr. I am a filmmaker. I come from a more traditional background, but for some strange reason this year, I started making short form content. And I did not know how it was going to go or how it was going to be received. But people like the videos for whatever reason. And um, you know, with my traditional filmmaking background, I want to share some tips that I've used for whether it's me or any of my clients I've worked with in my professional past, and still do, um, how to make your short form storytelling better. So today, we're going to be talking about structure, pacing, and the gear, tools, and the purpose behind your content. And at the end of every section, probably going to be eight minutes, 10 minutes long, we're going to do a one or two question Q&A, depending on how in depth the question is. And at the very end, we'll do an actual Q&A, try to get in as many questions as possible. So with short form storytelling, the hook is really, really important. Um, I feel like a lot of people waste time on their hooks. You have about 60 to 90 seconds, maybe two minutes if you're making a TikTok. But I mean, even then, it's kind of like hard to keep retention when you're just scrolling through. I feel like a lot of people waste time explaining who they are, um, or if they're selling a product, they're telling you about the product immediately. And that's one, that's not how you sell. That, and that's not how you sell yourself. And to be completely honest, when you're scrolling through your feed, nobody cares who you are. I can't even tell you how many uh, celebrities that I know of that I don't care what they're talking about. If I'm interested in whoever is talking, I'm gonna tune in. And when I see videos that start out with, hi, I'm so-and-so, and this is what I've done, and this is why you should listen to me, scroll, next. You want to get into the premise of your video immediately. And how I do that is I tell to my camera directly, I say, today we're going to learn about sound design. And I'll add like a description right above me, below me, wherever it may be, something more in depth. This is how you do sound design for free. This is how you do sound design on a budget. This is how you do sound design for under $200. And right there, immediately, within like the first three seconds, bam. If you're interested, you're going to stay for a few more seconds. If not, scroll. It doesn't apply to you. And that's OK. So hooks, when you do your short form content, get into it immediately. I promise you, nobody cares who you are at the beginning of the video. But maybe towards the end, they will. Maybe they will shoot you a follow. You don't have to tell people to follow you. Like when people 10 seconds into it, hit like. Comments on it to boost the algorithm, no. None of that works, and people will tune out. I promise you, everybody that I've worked with, all the brands that I've worked with as a director or in my professional field, it never works out. People are tuned out. Next, the plot. Story direction, and something really important is point A to B isn't a straight line, OK? I mean, sometimes it is. You know, if you're doing a, a wedding video, that's a straightforward storyline. But if you're trying to make, I guess, interesting content, an interesting story within 90 seconds, you still want to keep the basic principles of storytelling, which is tension. You want to build a climax, right? You don't want, you know, some of the most boring films and movies is, is you know what's going to happen next. Don't you hate it when you're, you're in a movie theater? And you can predict what's going to happen. There's not enough tension. There's not enough, there's not an element of surprise, right? And I, I be, <laughs> every time I watch a movie and I, I predict what's going to happen, I'm just like, God damn it, like, why? Why, dude, like, you could have done this. But that's just me. I'm a, I'm a filmmaking nerd, right? So a way to do this, whether through your voiceovers or through, you know, your on-camera dialogue is, don't, um, I don't want to say don't, okay? Because there are rules, but rules are obviously meant to be broken as well. If I told you a story today, I woke up and then I got ready to speak. I got myself a bagel. What, am I, what did I do next? I came over here, I walked here, and now I'm speaking to y'all. 
Okay, that's a pretty bland storyline. But, and I don't want to say, I don't want to say fake some tension or fake a conflict, but just be honest. I mean, it's, it's not embarrassing to say things that didn't go right. You know, a perfect story is a boring story, right? We want, some, we want something to feel like at the end, you watch the character win or lose. So today, I woke up, I got ready for this, this conference, and I didn't know what to wear. <laughs> Time was running out. I was going through my outfits. I realized I had a, a, a big stain on the shirt that I wanted to wear, which I actually do. Put on another outfit. I realized I was sweating in it because it was just strangely hot today in New York. But whatever. I don't think anybody's going to notice a stain on my shirt. I go over. I get ready. I, I still haven't had breakfast. I'm rushing on my way to watch Casey Neistat. And I'm eating a bagel. It is dead silent in the room. And I'm unwrapping my bagel. And it is the loudest thing ever. It's like, I'm just, bro, like, I'm trying to do this as I'm preparing myself to go to, to this talk. And I realize maybe that triple shot espresso and bagel wasn't the right thing to do before this talk. So now I have about 10 minutes left, and I really need to use the bathroom, knowing that I take 15-minute bathroom breaks. And now I'm here at the talk. You know, you want to create some sort of, some sort of conflict to end up at your resolution. And uh, I guess me, <laughs> me using the bathroom is like the climax of that story. But you see what I'm getting here, right? You see what I'm getting at here? It's like, I don't want to say try to make it up, but I promise you there are, little, there are little tidbits and moments within your story or within your day that you can create tension. That's what keeps us entertained. That's what keeps us watching. We want to see you solve something. I, I'm pretty sure most movies out there are trying to solve something, right? I mean, they made dinosaurs out of dinosaur eggs. The dinosaurs started to eat them. And then they tried to escape from the dinosaurs, Jurassic Park. Like if it was, if they said, we made dinosaurs and it was cool and uh, it, it was a happy theme park, <laughs> I wouldn't watch that movie. Next, the conclusion, the relief of tension. Um, you want to feel like the viewer is rewarded. If you're not rewarded, I mean, sometimes it works. I think M. Night Shyamalan is, is known for, for pissing you off at the end of movies. Right? People still watch them, but I know what I'm getting into. I'm going to be upset <laughs> at the end of it. They, I, I wanted to feel like a reward. There's that one TikTok. It's like a reward. That's all I think about TikToks, man. Um, you want to feel like you're giving the viewer a reward. Did you win? Did you lose? Did you learn something at the very least? Um, whether this is a cooking video, a styling video, a vlog of you going to an event, a couple vlog, a travel vlog. You want to feel like your viewer learned something. Are they going to go somewhere next? Are they going to travel to your destination? Are they going to cook your recipe? Are they going to try your styling tips? You want to reward your viewer. And I think um, a lot of content creators make it about themselves. I mean, it is about you. You're expressing your art. But ultimately, I don't want to say your career doesn't exist without the viewer, but I mean, it doesn't. You want to, I don't want to say always appease your viewer, but you want to think about it with the viewer in mind. So when it comes to ending your video, I mean, you could say, hey, follow me for more. That's, that's cool. You can plug it in a little bit. But within 90 seconds, you waste so much time trying to convince people to follow you. If they like your story, if they like how you deliver your story, if they like your quality or what you give, the value you give, or how you educated them, they're going to follow. Um, my first video, I am guilty of it. I said, hey, if you want to join me on this ride, you can follow me along. Um, do I regret it? Not necessarily. I did learn, but I could have also used that eight seconds for something else. So now I never say it. Right? And I'm not going to tell, and I don't want to explicitly say don't tell people to follow you, but within 90 seconds, if you're making an Instagram reel, like understand that that time is so valuable. If you create good content consistently that gives value, people are going to want to follow. 
think what I hate right now, there's this trend going on, and, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to poke fun at any of y'all who do this or seem like a know-it-all, but there seems to be some sort of like trend of how I grew 10,000 followers in two weeks, and it's seven seconds long, and it says, read the caption. So like the video loops, that is, that no, why would anybody want, there's no story, there's no value. I mean, you're reading it and you're, you're cheating the algorithm, I guess, because people are watching it or saving it. But ultimately, that, that can only last for so long, right? You want a story for people to follow no matter what niche you're in. And just by being genuine and open and vulnerable about your ups and downs of your day, I mean, it, I promise you, it's enough. Okay, so we're on to the next, we're on to pacing, but I wanna open it up for one or two questions about story structure. You, yeah, yeah, yeah with the, the dress. <laughs> it's all good. So I understand, I also have a film degree, and I'm kind of struggling too with that, like like you said, the rules are meant to be broken, yeah. but film school kind of hounds it into you, you know, rule of thirds and all that stuff, so how did you break out of the normal, this is the way the textbook tells us story structure? I mean, it's similar, but like, how do you kind of break out of those rigid habits, patterns, textbook, when it's hard? I mean, I don't... I don't think I've necessarily strayed too far um, from the rules. I still keep in mind the rule of thirds. I still keep in mind like the science behind my lens choice. But in terms of um, traditional storytelling, it's just it's it's just really condensed, right? So I mean, it's still a three-part story. It's still a beginning, middle, and end. Um, but yeah, I mean, I. I do break the rules, but I don't think I break them too much. I think the fundamentals of storytelling, whether it's a commercial music video or a long form movie, like a feature film, I still keep them. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Hey, Adrian, what's going on? I'm Tom. Uh, nice to meet you, Tom. Here. Love your work. Thank you. Um, been following along since the beginning of this year um, when you started to do your 365 mission, mm -hmm. and I know that it's well through the year now, so I'm curious, yeah. how's that going? Um, man, so yeah, I just started my, my content creating journey in January, um, which is wild, and, I, and I'm here now talking about content creating. I think it, I can honestly say it's changed my life. You know, with a, a traditional filmmaking background, you know, I'm so used to being on sets with a DP and two ACs and AD, a producer, multiple producers and PAs, a gaffer, grips, electricians, the entire thing. Um, and always being told what to do and how to do it, right? So I don't know if y'all saw Casey's talk, but um, Casey talked about Nike, right? And how, you know, when you're making something for a brand like Nike or Apple or whatever, it's still a Nike commercial, right? And you know, I, I don't want to say I got tired of it, but like, you know, Nike was just, it was, it was just like on a, what, what, what is that word called? It's on my bucket list of brands to work with. I finally got that gig as a director and I was super grateful for sure. But at the end of the day, it, it was me that was directing it, but it wasn't, it also wasn't me. Like, it, it still had to be Nike branded, Nike text, Nike everything. You can only do so much when you work with brands and artists and clients because you're just an extension of their brand. And when it came to my content creating, it's 365 days, nobody's telling me how to do it. Nobody's telling me this is your deadline. Nobody's telling me any revisions. It's, it's completely based on me. Um, and I like it here. I think it's going well, and I think it's changed my life not because of what necessarily it, the, the benefits that I've reaped of it, but just what it does for me creatively. I'm fully expressing myself with nobody telling me how to do it. You know, I mean, I'm self-aware enough to learn. I'm self-aware enough to, uh, to understand what can be better. 
And I'm just happy to do it on my own terms, and I think that's what's changed the most. Hope that answers your question. So next, let's talk about pacing. I understand we have 90 seconds, 60 seconds, or whatever, but don't rush. You know, um, you still want to deliver a story. You still want it to breathe. Um, I think somebody, he's actually in this crowd. I'm going to shout him out. Somebody who I think that makes really great short form content. He says a lot in his videos, but it doesn't feel rushed is actually my dog right there, Ethan. You can stand up, dog. Come on, man. <laughs> he makes great content. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of really good people. Um, my other dog in, in, uh, in London, his name is Paolo. Um, these guys say a lot in their videos, but it doesn't feel forced to fit within 90 seconds. Um, if you run out of time to say what you got to say, it's, it's okay. Cut it down. Honestly, if, if people like your content, they'll follow and they'll see more parts. You know, like I, I've made videos about how to take better pictures of your girlfriend. And I aimed to make it one part, but it, it was just way too much to fit into one video. And you know, I talked with the pace, and it just didn't work out. It's OK. Um, there's a lot of videos where I feel like people are just blazing through a storyline that the emotion and the story gets lost. Uh, the only thing that you get out of that is like, this person is panicking. And you can, you can kind of tell. Something that actually also that I do, that I, I'm actually planning on making a video next about this, is uh, your music. Picking out your music is really, really important. Um, I pick out my music first. Like, I'll go through my songs um, on my Spotify playlist and say, all right, I'm going to do it to this pacing. Actually, I could actually, I could actually demonstrate what I do. Because I think fitting your dialogue or your voiceover in the pockets and within the tempo of your music is important. I think it's a detail that not that many people think about. And if you don't know that today, I promise you this will make your content way better. Okay, Here we go. Let me find a song. Aha. You hear this? All right. So what I do is I'll listen to the song before I hit record on my microphone. You hear this? I understand that tempo. So now I'm talking within the pockets of the beat. And it's not something most people would notice, but you feel it. You understand why you're, you're more in tune to what I'm saying, matching the tempo of the song, right? Now, if I get out of the pocket and now I'm talking a little too fast ahead of the beat, you're not as in tune. You want to fit it within the, the pockets of tempo. So next time you're out there creating, pick a song first. Play the song, pick out the tempo, memorize it. I'll pause it. This is in my head. I'm going to go up to my camera. I'll hit record. And I'll have that song playing in my head. So today, we're going to talk about how to use your lavalier mic. And it's on beat. When I bring it into my editor, I drag the song on there and it matches up perfectly. There's this video that I did at the beginning of the year. It's dun, dun, dun. And I had that tempo. I said, today, I'm making a video every day, 365 days a year. Boom, door closes. And uh, a huge part of why I think people were so entranced in it, and what I, when I read the comments, is damn. This is really detailed. It goes with a beat. It's like a music video. It's because I pick out my music first. And I think uh, you know, once you find that and you find your music and find your, your pockets of tempo, it's uh, like a psychological secret that you can use as a tool to uh, get people more tuned into your content. And there's a lot of psychological secrets and tips, right? We'll get into that later. but. Lens choice is a huge one, but that's further down the line. I, I, storytelling, it does come down to if you're delivering a good story, for sure. But there's a lot of ways. I don't. It's literally a science. And 
if there's anything, the biggest tip that I can leave y'all with today, pick the music out. And that helps with your delivery and your tone. You know, you're not gonna pick a super hype song and talk about something depressing. You know, I'm not about to play Drake's Rich Flex and be like, today, I just didn't feel like myself. I don't feel, I feel like a plastic bag floating in the wind and it's like the hardest 21 Savage beat, you know? Um, and next, that helps your pacing is your writing. Um, when I write, I actually time myself. I time my dialogue, I know I have 90 seconds, so I'm gonna write about 70 seconds worth of dialogue, um, just in case my B-roll um, you know, runs longer, which it always does. So I'll write my script, I'll say it to the music, kind of like how a rapper like talks to a beat. I literally do that. I play the song, look at how long it takes me to say my script, and once I have that, I'm done. And the last thing on there, don't overcomplicate it. I know it sounds really complicating, all these methods and, and formulas to make the, the perfect short form story. Um, honestly, it just comes down to, to what you feel in your heart, as corny as that sounds. You know, there, there's a lot of times where I do write a script and I say, oh, I'm gonna do something else, I'm gonna say something else. But, you know, ultimately, I, as long as I keep the purpose of my story in there, um, I kind of just trust that it all comes together. I'm gonna open up to one or two questions about pacing. I saw your hand go up first. What's up, man? So, I know since you did the B65 challenge, mm -hmm. you know, it's a very big thing for your TikTok. How do you keep on different ideas just to keep that going? Or do uh, you just keep on finding inspiration? <coughs> um, I write my ideas down in my notes app. Um, I try to put out like one to three pieces of like actual produced content. Um, and then the rest of the four to five days, I don't want to say it's shit posting, but it's, I, I just shoot behind the scenes, man. I, I think um, there's value in seeing like the realness of what I'm going through or whether my camera slips and falls, which has happened way too many times, or it's really, really hot out and I'm sweating recording this, uh, this scene. I don't think too hard about it. I think there's a bunch of little bits of content that do add value. Um, that doesn't have to be that doesn't have to be fully thought out. Um, if you go through my TikTok, there, yeah, it's just it's just a bunch of random behind the scenes content. Some of it gets watched, some of it doesn't. But I mean, I'll I'll make sure of one thing: whatever I put out there, I enjoy, I like, and I'm proud of it. And I wouldn't put it out there just for the sake of putting it out there. Um, if I don't have anything or something that I don't like that I have for the day, I'm just not going to post it. If I miss one day out of 365 days, it's not gonna kill me. But um, yeah, I think just like putting something out that you're proud of is, is really important. And, and whether it's a produced piece of content or a little dinky behind the scenes, I just put it out. I don't think that hard about it. How long does it take you to create one TikTok? Um, it depends. Sometimes um, a video will be a cut down of a short film that I make and that takes five minutes, like a blooper. And I'll just throw it up just to throw it up. Um, but when it comes to my Sunday short films, it takes me about 15 to 30 minutes to write it. Um, I don't know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's 90 seconds, right? So I mean, I try not to think too hard and I'm confident in how I speak and how I deliver. So when, I, when it comes to writing, I kind of just talk things out with the music. And that takes about 15 to, to 30 or so. Uh, filming it, I take anywhere from 90 minutes to four hours sometimes. Filming a 90 second video, which sounds pretty insane. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't go anywhere past four hours or so. I feel like that's just overshooting. And if I am taking over four hours, it's because I didn't plan it as well as I should have. Uh, for the most part, it's under two hours. And with editing, it takes me about an hour, sometimes 30 to 45, just because I'll look at my script and 
when I film, like I film out of order, but I remember, you know, what scene is what, and my scripts are so detailed, like, oh, this is what I shot at the farmer's market, this is where I close the door. It's literally just plugging in and playing, you know, putting it into place with the dialogue. Um, color grading, probably 30 to 45 minutes. Um, I've made my presets for that for myself already. Um, but yeah, all in all, on average, it'll probably take six hours for one piece of content. Damn, that sounds like a long time. God, actually. Um, but yeah, I try, to, I try to deliver quality and value without, I don't want to say sacrificing my day, but um, yeah, I just try, try really hard not to let it consume me because I think that's how people burn out. I think mentally you can burn out by literally just thinking too hard about it or being a perfectionist. Um, you know, you finish editing something and you watch it over, you let it sit there for a day and say, I'm gonna come back to it and then you hate it. And then you try to re-edit some parts. It's like, bro, just put it out there. <laughs> like, you know, there, I've made a lot of films where I put out there and I, I wish I could have done better things and it's all right, man, you can't win everything. You know, I think, um, I don't want to say the less time you spend on it, the better you'll get, but the more times you do something over and over, the better you will get. So when you spend a bunch of time on one piece of content and not put it out or try to perfect it, I think, you know, that time spent on perfecting that one thing by putting hours into it, um, I think it hurts you in the long run. But that's just my opinion. You know, I, I, I don't think perfect exists. It's what I strive for, but um, because of uh, I got a regular day job and I try to fit my content within the pockets of time my day job, I try to minimize it as much as possible. Gear, um, I want to make this as, a, we're at a gear type expo and I do believe good gear will help your storytelling. But ultimately, it doesn't matter, bro. Uh, I want to say I film over 50% of my content on my iPhone. There's a lot of pickup scenes um, in my videos that uh, you would never know that are shot on an iPhone. I just put it on the, the cinematic mode and plug it in there. I color grade it to, to match my cinema camera and nobody will ever know. How will they know? <laughs> How will they know? But yeah, it really doesn't matter. Like Because of modern technology, everybody has a good quality camera on them, whether it's an Android, ugh, green bubbles, um, <laughs> or an iPhone. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Android quality is actually, it, their cameras are actually better. Um, I just don't want to inconvenience my friends in the group chats. Um, here are things that you don't need, OK? An expensive camera. Uh, you don't need an FX3. You can get the Sony ZV-E1. You can get the A6000, it's an old camera, that still works. And you can also just use your iPhone. Um, you don't need flashy editing, no tricks, you don't need After Effects. Stories are told with just regular cuts in movies. If you know how to do it, that's great, that's awesome. If it, if it serves your story, even better. Uh, but for me, I just make plain old cuts. You have 90 seconds to tell a short form story. I don't wanna see the flashiest VFX. If I feel emotionally connected to your story, I don't care if it's color graded either. Uh, graphic designing skills to make titles and fonts and whatever, you don't need that. You see Casey Neistat, he uses a big blocky font. I use a big blocky font. You watch Wes Anderson, you watch Quentin Tarantino, they all just use big blocky fonts. These guys aren't graphic designers, they're storytellers. Color grading, it helps. If, you know, it depends on the emotion you're trying to convey, but I mean, shit, that guy in the other room has never color graded his footage. It's about a story. Here's things that you do need, and it's gonna sound really obvious, duh, but a basic camera, we all have one. You know, at one point, I felt like the gear that I had was holding me back. I wasn't getting the same depth of field. My camera was a crop sensor, it wasn't full frame. Dude, nobody cares if your story sucks, I promise you. You don't need the newest camera every year. And while I do really like gear, um, whether you're on like a 10-year-old camera or the newest camera, 
I keep emphasizing it and going back to it, but if you have a developed story, none of it matters. And most importantly, discipline. The discipline to keep going, the discipline to, to understand your ego of wanting to be a perfectionist serves nobody but yourself and this fake sense of make, you know, reaching this goal that doesn't exist the discipline in trying it every single day or as much as you can to learn. The discipline to know that just because you're not getting views uh, doesn't mean your quality or your value is any less than somebody who gets views. Um, discipline is what I think is the most important thing when it comes to the repetition of this. You know, It's just like working out. You go to the gym, you, you try to stay in shape, and. If you don't go there, you don't have the discipline, you're gonna see no results. What do I know, I'm uh, overweight, dude. I'm chunky. <laughs> but I'm disciplined when it comes to camera. Camera stuff, I said camera. You know what's so funny? You, y'all seen Barbie? No? Ah, oh, man, so this is trend, it's like, my Ken's job is, so I, like, I, I always say camera without an S now, because uh, uh, my girlfriend said, my Ken's job is camera. Things that will help, but not make or break your storytelling. So I spoke about it earlier. Lenses, focal length, uh, that'll help a lot. Okay, If you can afford it, if you have the, the access to um, multiple focal lengths, they can help. Uh, microphones, audio is really important. You can watch a shitty quality video with good audio, and you'll be in tune. But you can't watch an 8K or a 4K video with shitty audio, there's wind blowing in the background, you're not gonna watch it, and that's, that's just fact. So I wanna say audio is just as important as the quality, if not more important. You want to, you know, you're delivering a story, so you want people to hear the story. The visuals just accompany it. Color grading, depending on the emotion you're trying to convey, if it's uh, sad, you can desaturate it. You can make it cold. If it's happy, vibrant, you can make it pop a little bit more, and we'll, we'll get right into that. So when it comes to lens choice, I have kind of a, a formula when it comes to, to short form storytelling. You know, We're not making a feature film here or, or a YouTube video. So when I make my cuts, I like, I like going from a wide to a medium. I, I rarely go from a wide to a wide um, just because I feel like it's a waste of a shot within my 90 seconds and I want my viewer to feel, I don't want it to, to feel boring, right? If I go from a medium to a medium to another medium, let's say, let's say it's a shot of me just this and then I turn to my side and I get a side angle shot of just this again, and then I get another like diagonal shot of this again. It's like, it, it doesn't cut as well. So I'll go from a wide shot, and then I'll go immediately to something like this, a medium shot. So when you're writing your stories in your script, I know it's looked down upon in your screenplay writing to, to write your shots and you want to leave it up to your DP, but when you're doing things by yourself, you are your director, you are your cinematographer. Keep in mind, I think these tips will help deliver your story more and keep your viewer just more in tune. Close up. On the right side, it's about a 35 to 50 millimeter, and that gives a different emotion than on the left. It's still this shot, right? but they're using a wider lens. It could be anywhere from like a 12 millimeter to an 18 millimeter. And let's talk about the one on the right. So on the right side, it's more personal. You know, it's, it's more striking. It feels like what we see with our eyes. And when I'm trying to deliver something that's personal or deliver something that I want you to really pay attention to, I'll use a 35 to a 50 millimeter because it blurs out the background, the focus is on me, it's what our eyes feel as more normal. And on the left side, it is the same framing, it, it goes up to here, but with a wide lens, it distorts things. 
It's anxiety inducing. It can feel scary. So in a lot of horror films, they use super wide lenses. They'll get right up on you with a wide lens and fill the frame up. And because of the distortion, it de this close up delivers a completely wildly different emotion when you're watching. And a lot of these things, they're felt. They're not really noticed or seen, but when a story's done right, you'll notice them because it feels a, you know, a, a different emotion be, depending on the shot types. And next is the extreme close-ups. And something that I do in my films, actually, is when I go from a wide shot, let's say the top left, I'm driving down the street, I'm introducing the top, you know, what I'm talking about, and then it'll be a shot of my eyes, super close up, and then it'll be a medium shot of me in the car top left. And that's how you make your editing more dynamic. If I were to go from top left to top left, that's okay, but if you wanna make it a little bit more dynamic, the shot doesn't even need to be a full second. If you go from, let's say, this guy on the bottom right, he's walking, a wide shot, and then you go to the extreme close-up of the door handle, then you go to the medium shot, like the bottom left, it makes your visuals more dynamic. So that's a formula I like to keep in mind. I'll go from wide, extreme close-up, to medium, to extreme close-up, to close-up, to wide. I like to, to give it variation. And that's something that will help your story and will, will keep your audience attention retained. Audio. Um, as long as it's clear, you can use anything. I personally use these uh, wireless lab microphones. Um, they're kind of pricey, but you know, on Amazon, you can, oh, at P&H, you can get. <laughs> I'm sorry. But at B&H, there are really great microphones that are like $100 or less. Um, <laughs> I don't use Amazon, what the heck? Who, who uses that? Um, but yeah, anywhere, you, you can find microphones for less than $80, $50, plug straight into your phone. I use my phone as my recorder a lot. I've actually made a video recently how I just walk up to things like my door closing. Boom, I'll grab the audio. I don't want to take my lavalier mic and do this next to my car door. So that's all I do. I use my phone. And sound design. Um, storytelling, visually, I, I want to hear what's going on. If you're, if you're at the beach and I don't hear the waves, it feels weird, right? If, I, if, if I'm at a park and I don't hear birds, it, it feels empty. Um, these are things that aren't really noticed, but they're, they're felt. So in all my videos, I meticulously go through all of my sound design. You know, I have a, a whole folder of things that I've recorded on my phone, whether it's waves, whether it's, it's me driving in my car, uh, the sound of me chopping vegetables. I, I throw it in there and I match it with my footage. Um, and that's just the free way to do it. I know there's like subscriptions out there for stock sounds, but they're really expensive. <laughs> um, so you ain't got to do any of that. Oh, YouTube also works. I, I've downloaded sounds from YouTube. Color grading. Uh, I spoke about this earlier. It's, uh, for example, the top right is something, it's, it's more desaturated. It's a war film, and, and, and war films feel kind of somber. So rarely will you ever see a war film that pops out to you like on the top left, a Wes Anderson film. Um, and a horror story, a horror film on the bottom right. If you're talking about something somber or sad, desaturating your color or making it cooler will help tell that story. Um, if it's a hot, bright summer day and you want to, you know, or if you're making something happy, uh, exciting, Maybe you want to add some more saturation. Maybe you want it to pop. So in my videos, what, depending on the emotion, I will color grade to, you know, to help that story. But it's also not necessary. If you don't know how to color grade, it's OK. <laughs> I promise you, you'll be just fine. I feel like when you make art, yes, it is somewhat self-serving. Um, but ultimately, I think as artists who are also like 
somewhat, not narcissistic, but you, you want people to see it. You want to feel good about your art. And the purpose behind it should be rooted in, in, in value, right? You want to give value to whether it be your niche community. You know, you want to, you want to serve something. And I think once you remove the purpose of art and self-serving and followers and views, it'll come to you. I went into this making things that I wanted to see. I went into this making things that I wish I could see and inspire, you know, be inspired by. I think the biggest misconception is views and follows and how big your, you know, how much your, your content gets viewed as being synonymous, being successful, and how good your art is. And I don't think that's true. <laughs> I've been doing the same style of video for years, over a decade, and it just so happens in January and February, people started to pay attention. I could have gave up. I could have thought that my art stinks, but no, I kind of just kept on going, you know, and, and had the self-awareness enough to, to understand where my art could get better. And once you find the purpose, the actual purpose behind you doing your art, which should be rooted in expressing yourself or, or your craft, um, it all just starts to flow. People will notice that you're not trying to sell them on anything. And I think this is something that people miss out on. I think that a lot of people's purpose that I see online right now is trying to collect followers or talk about how you gained X amount of followers in X amount of time, and that's not it. Just make cool stuff or things that you think is cool and whether people like it or not, it doesn't matter. You know, there's, there, I, I get comments of people talking about, oh, you could have done this, or people have made videos as to why my cinematography is wrong. I don't give a fuck. I like it. And if you like your, your content, that's all that matters. And that's it. <laughs>